Hello, hello, hello. Hey, everybody. Um, hi, Nima. Um, thank you guys all for coming on short notice. Um, Pete basically planned a wedding in three days. We have fed 150 people and held an event. So if you need him for any of your uh, planning, Pete, raise your hand. There he is. So great job. Um, um, what's cool about this event for us is that it's really five years that has led to this moment. Um, when Jordan and I started the Arch Network, one of the things that we used to do, we would sit down and say, hey, who out there in the world would it be good to try and develop a relationship with? And we would identify different people. And some of those people are in this room. Um, and one of those people was Gary Vaynerchuk. And so when I brought that up, Jordan said, what team does he play for? And I said, no, Jordan, he's not, he's not a football player. Um, he's, he's a marketer. And so we pulled up some of his videos and we watched them. This was back before Gary had the personal trainer every day and a fresh haircut daily. So, but, so Jordan got a sense of who that was and he said, okay, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go make it happen. Um, and then over the course of five years, they sort of found, um, that they're kindred spirits and that they both will prescribe to something that Jordan likes to call the, the hands down or palms down approach, which is just that they're eager to give more value than they take. And, um, Jordan discovered that uh, Gary actually does play football. He plays for the New York Jets every Sunday uh, in the fall and is a huge fan and gets as close to the field as he can. And so through their connection in football and some of the things that Gary was doing um, in that space, they became close friends. And they've just been trying to outdo each other in terms of how much value they're offering to one another through that process, which has been cool. Um, and so we're really reaping the benefit. And I think today Gary jumps back in front of Jordan as offering more value than vice versa. So we're, we're really stoked to have them. Jordan's get, they're going to go through about um, 30 minutes of just sort of talking fireside chat style. And then we'll open it up to a Q&A to everybody. So get your questions ready. But uh, help me welcome Jordan Palmer and Gary Vaynerchuk. Thank you, Taylor. Audio good. Everyone hear me all right? Beatbox. Um, thank you so much, Gary. Thank you so much for joining us. Of course, I know, man. I know you only go on like one or two trips a year, and so it's awesome that you chose this to be one of your trips. Um, but I will say this, this is the biggest cosign I've ever given Jordan. Uh, I l promised myself that I would take no more red eyes. Like, it's just enough. Like, how much can your body take kind of thing? And uh, my schedule worked out uh, in a way where... I was able to leave a little bit earlier from why I'm out here and was able to kind of get back and make my flight. And when when T Tyler, my admin, hit me up and was like, hey, great news, we don't have to take a red eye, but we might have to cancel on Jordan and do it another time. I'm like, oh, fuck, I just can't. He's already fucking sent the invite and everything. So the fact that I'm sitting here and I have to take a red eye tonight means like I really fucking love you, dude. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. You also fit on planes better than me. That's I for can't sure. Do red eyes. Fold it up. Um, well, very cool. So, just some, for folks in the room, we've got um, you know we've got some clients here. We've got some some friends, some folks from the other um, other industries that we've worked with. Um, and from the client standpoint, some folks that are on the startup side of things, and some folks that are plus fifty million in e-commerce revenue annually. Um, and so, just to kind of get a, a taste, we've got some folks that have flown in from all over. Um, from Born Primitive, it's really cool to see Bear. Bear's active uh, SEAL Team Six member. Um, so obviously appreciate your service and everything, but also an amazing entrepreneur. Um, we look around the room from all different types of folks. Um, on the investment side of things, Paul Gomez, who's been a mentor of mine for years, started tons of businesses. So it's really exciting to kind of get this type of room together. Um, so with that, I, I think I'll just kind of kick it off with, uh, you know, in terms of giving advice. So we'll start with like at a, somebody who's at a million, somebody who's at 10, and somebody who's at 50. Depending on where they're at, like, what's a piece of advice you'd give to somebody who's at the early stage of a million, somebody's where, right in the middle, and then somebody who's really looking to scale? You know, I think, first of all, I think to, to really answer it honestly, and it's a little more heady, but it's the truth, if I was sitting with one of you right now for five minutes, I'd, I'd want to know what are you trying to do? You know, like, you know, the, the, what you're trying to accomplish is just an unbelievably important part. I think we get caught up in going from one to five, to five, to 10, to 10, to 20, 20, you know, you get so caught up in the game. It's like the biggest reason I think people are struggling with social media. Literally people are pandering to a like on an Instagram post, not on necessarily what they're trying to do. So I think first and foremost, at a macro, you need to understand, are you actually building your business to sell it? 
because then you may care about you know the EBITDA and how much profit you're making, and so that advice is important. VaynerMedia is going to do 170 million dollars, and I'm not going to make a penny. Like I'm trying to pour it all back in. Literally, we may make zero profit this year, and it's because I don't want to sell it tomorrow, and I don't need the dividends from the profits in the year to change my lifestyle. So I mean this. It's really important. You have to know what you're doing and like why you're doing it. And by the way, you can change your mind. You could be sitting here and be like, I'm gonna change the world, you know, great. And then in two years you wanna buy an island, that's great, and everything in between. So first, what? I think for the people at one, the most basic answer is, for the people at one in key e-commerce, I always lean towards really auditing the math and understanding have they really fundamentally gotten down to the, their DTC, CAC, LTV understandings. Like, like get great, great, great at math. The big difference to me of a $1 million e-commerce company and a $50 million e-commerce company is that at one million, there's still a lot of conversation to have about math and at 50, it's time to really start talking about art because a lot of people have milked all their, you know, data math kind of levers and the reason they're not seeing their their numbers as good as they used to is they've squeezed where they've been efficient so much mathematically they haven't taken the risks of making a hundred sixty three thousand dollar video which will then drive down their math because they built brand so the, the biggest thing I see between one and 50 is this kind of math art conversation that I'm passionate about. Vayner's mission, my, I think what has made me me in a lot of ways as an entrepreneur and as a marketer is this unbelievable respect for both math and art. And I mean like 50-50. I mean like it's your two children. You love them the same kind of shit. Uh, and I see almost everybody else skew too far in one way or the other. It's awesome. Uh, shifting gears on the content side of things. So it's a big part of what we do um, in terms of content at all stages of the funnel, whether that's um, you know testimonial content at the top of the prospecting level or brand videos. Um, taking a big step back on the content side of things, you produce a lot for you personally and you're on the brand side of things, what is the most relevant types of content to make? I think Facebook long form video is the most interesting thing to make. I, I can't get enough of wanting to mitigate my risk on making four videos that cost me 50,000 bucks or $500,000 to be honest with you. Like no question there's moments and times for mediums. Like making a commercial in 1972 was a really good idea. Like everybody watched TV, everybody watched commercials. Making a Facebook video, especially if it's longer form and you can really drill it home, but longer you're gonna have to make it better for the target audience, but if you can crush a minute 27 second video right now for your business on Facebook for real, the upside's enormous because the media's underpriced and then the virality can take over and you're getting awareness for free, in theory, or amortized down. I just, I, I couldn't re recommend enough for the people here that are mathematically and financially disciplined to take that $100,000 risk. Uh, the problem is sometimes you miss. And you know, you spend eighty-seven thousand dollars making a video. You spend fifty thousand dollars spending, you know, media against it, and it didn't do much more than something that you could have taken a picture on your phone and post. And you're like, "Fuck, why'd I do that?" You do it because branding matters. You do it because where's the beef and just do it. And the Dollar Shave Club video changed the trajectory of your career. You do it because I love football so much. Because you have to throw the ball deep to get the defense to soften up a little bit. Like you do it. You have to do it. And most people don't want to do it because they don't, they want to just, it, they're, they're, they're salespeople who are disguised as marketers. So talk about cadence a little bit. How often? Uh, as often as you can afford it when it's this moment. It's this moment. Guys, Facebook CPMs are going to be $80, not seven. Like everybody thinks they're a fucking genius here right now. It's going to go away. I saw you guys. It was 2002. It was called Google AdWords. It's gonna go away. And then you get real sad because you remember the good old days when we were in a fucking gym and it was nice outside. <laughs> I'm telling you, listen, I'm putting pressure on us because as much as you're winning, you can win more because I know for sure it is macro grossly underpriced. More influencer marketing, more Facebook ads, it will work. It's grossly underpriced. I always think about things like this. You always have to look at who's winning. When I see very average entrepreneurs start a t-shirt brand 
and sell $500,000 worth of t-shirts on the back of DMing people on Instagram, you know the getting is good. Be thoughtful, this is a moment in time, it will go away. Because as soon as my clients fully get there, Pepsi, GE, Quaker, Kimberly Clark, the NFL, like when they get there and they take that bullshit money that they're throwing away directly in the garbage on programmatic banner ads and on fucking television and on outdoor and sponsorship and dog shit after dog shit and they take that money and they put it into Facebook, it's gonna get a lot harder getting in front of who you want to. It's just a marketplace and we get lulled into the good times. So as much as humanly possible. There's a reason I'm not making any money right now. This is not the time to make money. This is the time to buy attention at scale and leverage it in the long term. So you touched on it a little bit. Um, you said influencers. Yes. So another thing that we really focus on is the influencer marketing side of things. Yep. Um, and from aligning it with the brand to be able to continue to tell the brand story, but also from an audience standpoint, you talk about buying attention a lot. Um, so you have Vayner Media, you have Vayner Sports, which is a sports agency, you have Vayner Talent. What, what is the ideal relationship uh, both from an audience standpoint, but also from a working relationship between a brand and an influencer? Uh, for the second part, get out of the influencer's way is the right relationship. When we try to micromanage an influencer and how you wanna see your brand show up, when, they know, when we came to them because they've been able to develop an audience and they understand their audience, we have too much ego at the owner and creative level of like our point of view on creative we need to allow it to be interpreted in the distribution that it's getting. I'd much rather let that comedian or model or, or whoever interpret my brand in their way to strike the audience's way. So the second part is get out of the way. Give them like three things, like no bestiality, no, you know, like give them three things that are not cool. You know what I mean? Like go to the most extreme, like none of that stuff, none of the stuff that will like get you in the headlines but everything else, like, are you really arguing with them of like the, the color shirt they're wearing or like the lighting or all the dumb shit that people spend unlimited time on that doesn't mean anything? Um, so that's how I think about the right relationship. I think it's the most inefficient marketplace, which means there's huge opportunity. Humans don't know how to price themselves. And then when agents get involved, UTA and William Morris and CA fuck it up. They price them too high and it's all fucked up and so you can get somebody, you can literally get two influencers, DM at the same time, they'll literally get you this exact same business results and one of them wants $100 for a post, the other one wants 50,000. That's happening right now. I love that shit. I love that because that's different than Facebook where the math plays itself out over time. Humans will continue to be inefficient but I do think that Facebook and Instagram are gonna get involved in that game and take a rack the way we see in KOLs in China. I'm completely convinced that Facebook is gonna layer on, in an Instagram world, a 20% tax on influencer marketing on the influencer, uh, as they should, and if you really look at the moves they've been doing and the TOS, and that's great. A lot of influencers are like, fuck that. I'm like, uh-uh, that's good. You want that to happen, because then the industry itself, and so um, that's where I see that going. So in, in terms of uh, approaching the influencer, side of things. Um, How many times a day does that happen? Every 45 seconds. Yeah. That's fucking awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. It's like World War II going on. Um, so in terms of approaching an influencer, um, and a lot of the folks in the room that we work with or are doing this on their own, look at this and say, well, I have, this is my audience, this is who my consumer is. That's, where, that's where the danger starts. The danger starts, like, if, you know, well then, t Timberland Boots would have never been popping in the streets in 1997. Like, it, you, the, is, there's a place where you've started and where you're seeing it, but be very thoughtful that brands can play out a lot of places. Vans have always done super well here, but there's a lot of 17-year-old kids in Atlanta in the hood right now wearing Vans. They might have missed that if they weren't thoughtful. I never thought at 42, white male, that I'd be really popular with 16 year olds, you know, like I am right now. So you have to be careful about pigeonholing your brand. I think it's important to over index in a certain demo at first, but I don't think you're detrimental to your brand if it's also doing well somewhere else. So it's one thing to think about, which is why when I think about everything, I just think about underpriced attention. To me, I'd, you know, I, 
I think an influencer who has a huge audience, who's giving me $17,000 worth of a media awareness, who wants 100 bucks, I almost don't even care if he's a bodybuilder and I'm selling like clothes for infants. My, my, I'm being serious, I just want you to hear this because it, it's an example that you need to understand. It will probably mathematically play out because enough of the audience, will, like there's always interpretation and if the influencer's creative, that will definitely play. And number two, it's just net awareness. The biggest companies in the world, Coca-Cola, BMW, the reason they're in trouble is they think television commercials gives them awareness. Their entire, entire system works on the fact that if we run a bunch of TV, everybody will kind of know about us. And that was right in 1983. That is super wrong now, and that's why they're in trouble. I believe that's happening on Facebook. I believe that's happening with influencers at scale, AKA 17,000 influencers in an influencer marketing campaign, not 17. So do you actually split it out and say, here's who my consumer is, this is an influencer who aligns with them, and here's some other markets that I'm looking to get into, and use influencers as a way to kind of test those markets? Not necessarily. I think of it as, if I have enough money, fuck it, let's just buy as many as we can that are underpriced. Now, do we want to start with 25% the first 25% really deep into our world, we're, we're selling surfer sunglasses and we go after surfers, sure, that's just smart, but in the long tail of it all, but if you can't afford it, then you wanna go more narrow into what you're at. Um, but again, gear. as you, you can tell, I'm pushing the audience right now very heavily to be like, rethink how much they're pouring back into their company because I regret Wine Library only getting to 60 million. It should have been three, if I was sitting in this crowd and somebody said this to me in 2002, Wine Library would have been 350 million. I fucked up. Do you understand? There's moments when things, like, it's real estate. There's moments when the beachfront property is available. Then it's not. Facebook and Instagram is the beachfront property of attention of the consumer. That's cheap. It's Malibu 63 years ago. Got it? So shifting gears in terms of other channels outside of those, a lot of people here playing those. What, uh, in your opinion, what channels are e-commerce brands right now missing out on? Podcast advertising. Pre-roll podcast at scale. It's just huge awareness. People are just listening. There I would probably go more towards your demo. Like if you're selling a tennis racket, it's probably good to go on a sports or lifestyle. Like there, there it's more, it's not as underpriced. And so like influencers and Facebook are so underpriced, it's like, fuck it. There, it's underpriced, it's just probably discounted by 20 to 50%, but I do think it can build a ton of awareness if you're very smart on buying pre-roll or native read advertising, especially if they're not part of a Gimlet or an NPR network and they're a one-off character, you might be able to get a real good deal. And if you feel, to me, you run a month, you like what you taste, lock that fucker up. Lock her up, lock him up for a year and let them read until they can't read no more. Uh, let's talk about Twitch. You've been playing around with Twitch a lot lately. Um, as a channel, is that something that brands should be looking at and why? For sure, um, because it's got an obnoxious amount of attention, especially if you're trying to target 15 to 30 year old dudes. But I think you're watching all the nuances of it spreading older and more gendered out. I mean, the amount of female gaming interest under 15 is extraordinary. That will play itself out over time. Uh, And I think that a lot of streamers, Twitchers, just don't know how to price themselves either. So brand integration, you know, is super interesting to me. And uh, in general, esports is going to be a monster thing for the rest of everybody's life in this room. I think people struggle with understanding things like, the 1982 NBA Finals was on tape delay in America. What they didn't even air it live. Like, you know, so if you're a youngster or not a historian, you kind of don't, it doesn't make sense. If you don't pay attention to history, you don't realize that horse racing and baseball and boxing were the only sports in America that like mattered at all. College football, a distant fourth, pro football, a joke. So, you know, I mean, the Super Bowl one did not sell out. Didn't sell out. So esports is gonna be a fucking monster. I, I, I personally think it's already disproportionately bigger than the NHL. Um, I think culturally it's, you know, in certain ways I think it's bigger than Major League Baseball already. I think baseball is making the biggest mistake because they're trying to make all their money on their own digital platforms. So you can't find a baseball clip on YouTube or Instagram to save your life. Bryce Harper could walk in here right now fucking naked and nobody would give a fuck. That's a problem and so 
I think that, uh, I think, uh, actually, we're, we're in a demo. You'd we're be wearing me, a Kalo ring though, yeah. right, Ted? <laughs> Uh, anyway, nonetheless, I think I think that uh, esports is a monster. I don't like to jump into things until I understand my place. So I've been, you know, I I was I was on the first Justin TV stream because I was a U streamer and a YouTuber in 2006 and seven. So I've been following this thing for a long time. I, when gaming really got to this place, especially when Twitch started growing up. I don't game, right? I wasn't playing Call of Duty. I wasn't playing Madden anymore. I didn't have time. So it felt inauthentic for me to do anything there. I didn't want to just barge in. I think it's important to be part of the community. Two years ago, I was like, fuck, wait a minute. I can retro game. And I can like have, like when you come and visit me for a meeting, we could go play Madden 94, you know, for, you know, 20 minutes or something. So once I figured that out, and so now I'm dream- I built a huge Twitch studio right outside my office. It just finished. I haven't seen it yet, so I'm excited to see it next week. And so when I have, you know, to me, I'm dreaming up like when Floyd Mayweather comes to have a meeting, we can play Ring Kings for like 30 minutes. Like I want to play retro games of the sport of the person that's coming in my office. So I don't want to lose. So I don't want to play Fortnite with Ninja. I want to. I want to play, you know, I want to play Draymond Green who's going to come in in NBA Jam for Sega and break his face. He's heating up. <laughs> <laughs> so then talk me through how somebody could get involved in Twitch and start to test that. So let's say that there's a brand in the I think room. the first thing you need to do is consume it. If you want to get into Twitch, first start watching it. Download the app, set up an account, taste it. And then you're like, oh shit. You know, like they zoom in on their hands all the time. I'm gonna fucking give them a bunch of rings. Or fuck, I sell water in a bag. And, like, I need to become the water in, of the fucking entire ecosystem. I'm just gonna send cases to every single Twitcher. So you've gotta understand the context of any room you're in. You've gotta listen first. I do, you know, I talk so much that I'm trying to tell people I'm such a listener. The only content I consume in the world, literally outside of Jets, football and you know Knicks are tough but like and Knicks basketball literally the only content I do not watch a single show or movie the only thing I do is read people's comments on content and that's why I'm an anthropologist and an insights guy really so I'm doing all, I'm basically doing all my listening when you don't see me and then everything else is talking based on listening doing and then talking a uh, very specific question that we get regularly is uh, is around kind of the Cambridge Analytics yes. um, uh, opinions on what's happening with Facebook. Can we talk about that a little bit? Non-event. What's that? It's a non-event. It's over. Nobody gives a fuck. Because in a macro, you don't care a about shorter pri- answer than mine. You guys don't care about privacy. You say you do, but your actions prove you don't. You know why it's so much more macro and heady? I don't want to get super crazy here, but it's because human beings are awesome and we're the most underrated brand in the world. The reason you don't care about privacy is for 99.99999% of you, nothing bad will ever happen if all of your shit's all over the place always and forever. We have a massive misunderstanding of the human spirit and what, what's actually happening here. Uh, and so we're having very interesting conversations around technology and we're fear-mongering it because it's exposing us. Um, super interesting times, Jordan, but, but it's a non-event. I've, I never buy public tr- tr- stock. Outside of Amazon, I've literally almost bought nothing. All my stock is because I invested in so many companies pre-IPO and then owned it. It's why I even have a portfolio. Uh, I bought a shitload of stock when Facebook went to 140 because I knew this was the last time this conversation was gonna happen, so I might as well strike. Um, it's a non-event. That's awesome. Uh, last question, then I'm going to tee it up for anybody who has questions in the room. This is just personally would have been weird if I just asked this one on one. So this is probably the setting for this. Of all the stuff you see, you're in sports, you're now in gaming, you're all these things. What, what is what are things that come up to you that are very impressive? That's interesting. Uh, what are things? So my mind, the first place my mind went is I'm impressed with the fact that naive and fresh eyes are always the best eyes. I'm impressed when, I love it. it. Like I love the fact that you, like oftentimes the most interesting shit I see is when someone is talking about something they know nothing about, but they're just putting their filter on something they're just finding out, and they actually got the right answers, and then they spend a ton of time making themselves stupider. 
I really am impressed by that. I'm fascinated by that. Um, you know, I'm impressed with, this is, this is back to the human spirit, I'm impressed with the youth in general. Like, I just love it. I really love it because there's, le- there's less defense in them. Um, it's the opposite of how I think about entrepreneurship. It's really interesting to me. Actually, this is a good medium for me to say this. A thought I've been thinking a lot about lately is how different sports and businesses, uh, even though I think they have so many similarities. In sports, as you start getting out of the prime of your skill set because of physical, mental uh, aspects, you pay the price. You were once the best, now you're getting knocked the fuck out. You were once the best, and now you're throwing interceptions, you're slow. Paul Pierce said something in interviews, like when some bum beat me on a play, where I was like, this guy passed me? He was like, I'm done. There was something about when you lose that step. I love that. It's why I love sports so much. The merit plays out, not in business. I'm really fascinated as my life has evolved and I've gotten to sit around some real fucking players, older real players. I hate business right now in the way that so many people play it. So many people who speak and preach capitalism and all that shit, when they get tired and they just want to be on a yacht and they just want to cash in and they're slow and now young lions can eat them, they spend all their money trying to change the rules of the game. Bullshit entrepreneurs. I can't believe how many people, 60 to 100 that I've met in the last three years are straight bullshit entrepreneurs. Fucking bullshit. I fucking hate it. Um, So it's just so interesting to me that you won by killing something else, but now that you're at that part, you're spending all your time trying to change the rules of the game. Such a disrespect for the game. So I'm impressed with the youth because it's offense oftentimes. Naive offense a lot of times. Entitled offense a lot of the times, but it's offense. Love that. I'll throw it to you guys. Anybody have any questions? And and listen, I think, you know, since we've got some time and here's a setting and I have context for a lot of this room, like this is the time to go very, very selfish and very practical, like specific. I'm thrilled to answer anything. It's a lot cheaper here. Gary, I love hearing you speak, man. Thank you, man. Uh, thank you for coming. So uh, Josh Trent, Wellness Force Media, I deal a lot in podcasting. You mentioned podcasting was like this huge space right now, yep. specifically for people that don't have an attachment to like a podcast one or something like that. How can people that run agencies that are dealing with a lot of podcasts monetize quickly? What does that look like to monetize as fast as possible? Uh, hold on to the mic for a second. For who to monetize? Their clients? For the actual podcaster. Um, yeah. I think it's selling upfront brand deals, you know, I mean, the, the, the problem with your question, brother, is that faster is bad. You're looking yeah. for faster, I know why, because it, it, it validates the medium. So many people want, your clients and anybody else you're talking to, wants to validate their time in this new place, and so if they can monetize, they're gonna invest more dollars into the production and infrastructure around it. The, the problem is, that's counterintuitive to the way great new things start. Facebook was not a platform from 2007 to 2011 that monetized so easily for the people that were on it until it then did. Like there's not a single person in this room or in the business world that shouldn't be building a podcast and losing money on it over the next three years because they're going to make more in year four, five, six. But if you told me, back to your first question, that you're very close to selling your company and you want to sell it in the next 18 months, well then that's a bad idea, right? But if you're looking to do what you're doing right now, five years from now, it's to me one of the best investments going because we're gonna continue to love audio because of the passive nature of it. We're also gonna fall in love with it based on Alexa and Google Home, right? So, you know, the only thing you can do to help them is to do a better job of getting businesses to put upfront dollars around branding and making spec bets on personalities or formats. That's hard. Thanks. You got it. If you can teach them that making the podcast also creates a lot of extra content that could be the content that they use to try to drive other parts of the business, uh uh-huh, it's another place to go. Hi. Hi, I'm Allison. Nice to Uh, meet you. Hi. We're starting a small uh, skincare brand. We're just getting started. Congrats. My my question is in terms of influencers. Yes. um, When we're going after them in terms of um, Facebook and Instagram, 
it's very obvious we have free product to give them so that they can give us a shout out. Is there some sort of dance we have to do or are we going to call a spade a spade and it's super obvious and we just want to give you products so you can give us a shout out? How does that work in terms of? I would call it like girl and boy dynamics, right? You know, when the boy rolls up on the girl, if he goes right in for the kill, the ROI tends to be lower than if he romances it a little bit. So, but sometimes it works. You know, all depends what the boy looks like. You know, and so I think your product, I'm being serious, I think your product matters. Um, to me, there's, a, there's an understanding there. I would tell you that even as a small company, you're probably gonna amortize out and win if you're thoughtful about your influencer marketing by giving without expectation of a shout out. If you're in such a place where you're worried in the beginning, like every little, every product counts, I get that. You, yeah. you know, every company's got their own thing. Look, you just have to recognize that you're gonna DM 100 people and be like, hey, I'm gonna give you a free product, I'm looking for you, if you know, we'd like you to post it, you know, you're just gonna get a lot less people responding and you're gonna spend seven hours to get 14 people. Got, got it, so it all amortized, this is where people are not thoughtful, right? Some people, you know, but, but you have your money or you have your time. So some people are in a position where spending seven hours to get 14 people is exactly where they're at at that point. Other people who maybe have a couple bucks to give away would be better off giving a couple bucks in there because they're gonna get 39 of the 50 people saying yes. So it's just a time, money, play. But being authentic and transparent is exactly right. Or innuendoing is great. You just have to know what you're getting yourself into. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. How you doing? Uh, Zach Zellner from Pup Socks. Uh, quick question for you, and since Common Thread doesn't charge me for questions, I'm going to stick two in one. Um, first and foremost, you know, we haven't heard anything about either Snap or Twitter, and wanted to know what you see as the media buying opportunities over the next five to ten years and how they'll develop. And the second part of that is, you know, I have a company that has a good product. We don't really have a brand. And it's a nine month old company, it's great. But, you know, what would you advise someone to do in the process of actually building a brand? that truly has a meaning to its consumers. So I think a couple things. Your brand specifically, the sock space and some of the other spaces, I'm really intrigued by. The number one advice I'd give you is create a pattern that looks like Louis Vuitton and bet the farm on it. Too many people in the sock space are trading off of other people's equity and IP and are really just a commodity. And then cool, you could win because you're better marketing right this second, but over time that amortizes and you lose. We've seen that over and over, right? So. Uh, you know, for example, there's a company I'm about to take a lot of equity in. It's kind of in the hoodie space and like cool, but I didn't give a shit about any of his numbers and her numbers because uh, I'm going to make a pattern that looks like Louis Vuitton and either I'm going to make a Tiffany light blue or a Louis Vuitton pattern or I'm not. But that's where the money is, right? Because I don't want to be at the mercy of the University of Miami's IP or fucking Star Wars IP or my IP. You know what I mean? So that's number one. As far as Twitter and Snap, I think if you're selling and branding, to people under 25, Snap's one of the most interesting places on the internet right now, because everybody's left it for dead. There's still a ton of attention, and the ads are $3 CPMs. And if you look at swipe up and sale numbers, the creative's tricky, because there's a lot of understanding, and the income levels of that demo are lower. But if you're thoughtful, and you play at it, you know, it's just so basic. Everybody's on Facebook and Instagram playing. It's unbelievable and it's still playing out. I, but I, I mean, your brand could absolutely win that game on Snap in those ads, but they're not gonna look better than Facebook's and they're not gonna look better than Instagram's in the short term. And so if you're trying to raise sales to raise capital from a VC, well then I get why you wouldn't. And this is why I keep saying, what are you up to? Because once I understand what you're up to, this is why Vayner does well or I do well. I've got a lot of answers. You know, this is why I tell everybody like, Ask questions now because my content's general. It can get more detailed right here as I'm doing it, right? Um, I do think your, the Snap ads can be incredible. Now, Twitter, real quick. So look, look. I think Snap, if Snap does not create a feature or an innovation, I think it will continue to dwindle, right? Like, they're gonna have to come up with something. I mean, look, I made a video back in the day that said Facebook was in trouble because Zucks didn't believe in mobile enough, which is the truth. People forget, Facebook was late to like fully going hard on mobile. That's why Twitter did what it did. Uh, anyway, Twitter I think is a totally interesting place. I've become actually dramatically more intrigued by Twitter. This room, people that do DR don't like it because the ads are shit. I like it because it's the place where if you have a great copywriter who's an improv writer and you troll your competitors or culture, you can explode. 
If you positively troll, right, you can do so a bunch of cool ass shit. Like think about what your voice or your brand can do when people are talking about being cold, feet, beach, feet on the beach, like just in culture. You know, like somebody hurts their toe in sports, you jump in, like there's just a million things you can do, right? What's your brand's point of view on, you know, the, the thing that went crazy two days ago with, you know, the, what sound do you hear? What's, you know, what's your take on game three of the Cavs? Like, you know, like you never know, right? So Twitter's very creative as a counterpunching, copywriting, culture hacking platform. Nobody wants to put in the patience or time or resources for brand. Everybody just wants to do sales. Uh, Franco, Bishop Tattoo Supply, Tattoo Machines. Um, unique market we're in. Uh, will you talk about the media buy-in power of Facebook and yes. probably Instagram? Um, Can you put the mic closer? Yeah, so Thanks when you talk me. about the media buy-in power of Facebook, yes. in terms of having, say, for example, us, we have an, in, an in-house marketing department. How do we learn the recipe of how to do that correctly? Because you said it correctly earlier. You said a lot of marketers are nothing more than salespeople. So when, when we're trying to learn more about how to build the recipe to do Facebook properly in terms of marketing. How does one learn? Like, talent. where can we go? Talent. How do we find talent? That seems so hard nowadays. I think what you should do is hire an outside firm and then fire them quickly once you get the IP. He's, he's kidding. He's totally kidding. <laughs> I'm super serious. Dude, I, I, what do you think I do for a living? I'm giving answers. That's what I think. I mean, you need, it's talent. You know, either you have internal talent. What you basically just said to me is like, how do we get our basketball team better at basketball? Talent. Like, the talent exists. Either you rent it or you own it. Not super complicated. But recognizing it's true is the starting point. And e-commerce direct-to-consumer businesses tend to not even understand it it's the reason Zynga and many other things went out of business. The math plays out. And if you over leverage, which many of you are about to, it gets really ugly. Can't wait to buy your businesses for 10 cents on a dollar. Hey Gary, my name's Johnny. Hey Johnny. Uh, a year ago, well, I'm currently actually still self-employed, but a year ago I was self-employed. I hated it. Yeah. I found your content. I, I was depressed and I had a lot of excuses. Uh, and in the last year, uh, you have completely changed the way I think. Uh, I've gotten rid of all my excuses. Uh, I'm actually in contention for an in internship here. I don't even have it yet. Uh, I'm 27, so I've still got three years to eat shit. Uh, and uh, I just want you to know I legitimately appreciate your content so much. Uh, Thank you, and man. And rather than being a number one in a small pool, I'm going to be number 13 in a big one. Super fucking smart, brother. Thank you. You're welcome, brother. That means a lot to me. You know, it's funny. I really appreciate that and it was one of the, you know, one of the great things about producing content every day and vlogging is you stumble on shit, you know? This, what you, you know, and I'm as emotional about this as you are, it's fucking crazy. Like, we built entrepreneurship up too much the other way, we overcorrected, and you've got a lot of, everybody under fucking 25 thinks they need to be an entrepreneur. The fact that, the fact that that hit you, it's real, man. Like. Man, I wish, I almost wish I was number 13 at Facebook. You know, like, like it makes me super happy. It's all about self-awareness. It's, my opening line was about self-awareness. What are you up to? Do you know how many people, bro, you know what my new one on this is? Because the reason I'm emotional about this is, man, you got fucking trucks too? <laughs> you know, it's super powerful. I think I'm also getting a little bit more emotional because that one, you can't, I mean, look, my life is so fucking awesome right now. Like. Do you know what it feels like to get 20,000 messages a day of like, you made my life better? It's just fucking, you know, you're just, I don't even know how to almost quant, like it's almost difficult to like comprehend. I've got a new one uh, that has been really like, kind of like similar to that. And like, I know that it's going to work. I know that, um, I know that there's so much opportunity for people to become more self-aware and figure themselves out and it's gonna help so much. And the new one I figured out is, there are so many people that would be so much happier making $27,000 less a year and the only thing they have to do is sell their current home where they only use 18% of the home anyway and buy a home that has two less bedrooms so they don't have to 
have the job that is paying to maintain the lifestyle that they've propped up for themselves and their life will be like disproportionately better, I'm gonna fucking pound that content. I'm gonna figure out some clever way to really penetrate, similar to close your eyes until you're 29, shit that people remember. I'm gonna fucking change the game on this one because it's a big one. Because there's a lot more people living that than what you, like as many entrepreneurs as they are that should be employees, there's way more people that basically build a life around how much they're earning, get to a place where they hate what they're doing to earn, have the opportunity to still do something that earns 20,000 less that they love, but they're golden handcuffed by worrying about what car they drive or where their house is because they actually care about other people's opinions and nobody has the gear to take a step backwards. The inability to take a step back, to take four steps forward in happiness based on other people's opinions of watching you take a step back blows my fucking face off. Right? Right? It's true, brother. Like, for me, like, I, I weirdly am the other way. I, I swear on this. Like, people that know me, the eight, I wish AJ was here. I want to lose everything, weirdly. The, like, literally other than, like, like, my kid, like, I don't even care about that, actually. I was about to say my kid. Like, I want to lose everything. <laughs> Mainly because the rising back up part is more romantic to me than the luxuries I have now. I love the process. The Joel Embiid thing is so awesome in there. You know, I love it. That, that's how I, by the way, that's the entrepreneurs I'm investing in these days. They can't breathe without building this shit. Not their good financial arbitrage humans who know how to raise capital and are looking to buy a yacht. Fucking love this place. I know this. Of course I remember him. Hi, Gary. Thanks for having me as an intern a couple of years ago. I enjoyed it and put me in touch with Common Thread Collective, where my students are vying for a job. So thank you so much for Makes that. Makes me so happy, brother. And um, currently I'm working on a book, The Social Customer Journey. What is your take on uh, managing a, s- a customer journey and what role social media plays in it? At a macro? Yeah. I mean, look. Understanding a customer journey is imperative, like how one gets to the place of them buying something or being affected by it matters. The way I think about social is, I think social is the number one place where human beings live. So what do I think? I think it fucking is the most important part of the customer journey in 2018. If you don't understand how one to six of the social networks play into the decision making of how people buy, vote, you know, solve, think, you know, it's the single most opportunistic platform to affect the journey. I think it's the backbone right now. Question, actually pretty similar. Gary and Patrick, uh, I've woken up a lot of mornings feeling lazy and I listen to your podcast, so you've yelled at me quite <laughs> a bit, so I appreciate that, man. No worries, man. Um, I wake up thinking about retaining and growing business. That's, that's my focus. Okay. So, similar to the gentleman to the left, like when VaynerMedia signs Pepsi, yes. talk to me a little bit about your mindset around keeping that business, because that's a big name. You got a lot of people, I'm sure, coming after you for that business. How do you keep it, grow it, stay influential within a Pepsi? I think about offense and defense. I think that too many people are half pregnant. I think that I build infrastructure around me to retain it, and I come in and bat phone to retain it, but most of my energy is predicated on getting more. I think too many people spend way too much energy and time at the top of organizations retaining. Um, I think it's a defensive move. I think there's a lot more commodity out there of retention than acquisition on the human level and the B2B level. And I think for founders, if they have the ability to go hunt and get, they should do as much of that as possible. I would argue, because I've been so disciplined in the last 15 months to get Vayner from 150 to 500, that I've been doing too much defense and literally I had this own talk with myself like nine days ago and like it's devastating how much business I've created in the last nine days. Offense. In business, I'm a firm believer that you wanna win the game 147 to 132. Like the way it is now, not like the Knicks that I loved 80 to 64. You like that one? I think it's a good one, especially for us, right? The founders, like, you really, really can find people. Because retention's interesting. You, what you learn, especially in big companies, 
is, you know, mid-size performance companies, retention is math. Big companies, retention is human to human engagement. Like, if I have an executive that knows how to go with the key decision maker's house and do barbecue with them twice a year, that's the retention, not how many blue cans sell. So a lot of, I look for emotional intelligence, EQ, personal skills, because that's what they're trading on. Small companies are like, your fucking CAC went up. Fuck you, you're fired. <laughs> hey, Gary. Hey, man. Um, going to when you were talking about long form video on Facebook, and I've heard you also talk about just long form, even text on Facebook, yes. places like that. Could, if you were to go back to just creating content and trying to build more of your jab, 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 right? Yes. Out, that element of just creating. Facebook, YouTube, yes. those sort of platforms. What are you doing differently on those platforms and what are you repurposing and doing the same? And Can you just maybe talk more about those things? Uh, let's, let's make it better for you. What are you looking for? Because I think some of the things I'm doing, I mean, I can answer it in a macro, but I want to go a little more micro. What are, you, are you, what are you trying to accomplish? Building brand through that? Right, building a brand. So I've been a professional photographer at a pretty high level for a long time and launched a company last year called Film Supply Club, which is a member-based community selling film, actually, like good old analog film. That's cool. But then also almost like a Costco model where as a photographer, you get everything you can as a photographer at a discount. Um, but I also do educational type stuff with an own personal blog, more on photography, and then have a podcast called The Artist Report interviewing other creatives. So How often do you do the podcast? That I put on hold last year as I was launching the other business. Um, yep. So it's back up and I also have a branch of that called The Photo Report. But I'm now going full throttle and producing content on YouTube, basically more vlogging plus educational photography. And then so everything, I, the podcast is then a marketing channel for Film Supply Club brought yep. to you by Film Supply Club. The answer is more. You know, the answer is more to your question, meaning... The vlog is the great gateway drug to opportunity. If you film everything the way I do, if you really go there, it's also producing your written copy, it's producing your social media content, it's producing your pictures for, what's amazing about a vlog is it can be the beginning point of a, you know, of a diamond where it just, just by creating a vlog, like the reason I can produce 144 pieces of content a day is because I have the employees, but also mainly, mainly, because I'm the bottleneck as a human, it's because I vlog. Because they'll all go through it, and the written articles, I get asked questions by my writer. And when you're one person, you do the most you can of it, but the answer's always more. Like, that's what's great about a vlog or a podcast. It's the gateway drug to your, you know, LinkedIn article. So the reason Ask Gary V Show was a big win for me was it's a great way to, like, use other people to create, you know, the content for you. But... The truth is, you know, every platform has its own context and you have to make the content contextual. What you have to understand is everybody here, when we're on Instagram versus YouTube versus Facebook versus LinkedIn, we're actually different. And so understanding the psychology of us while we're on those platforms is where I start, right? For example, Instagram was a really fucking funny thing for me. Like, I don't want to be a motivational speaker. I love that I'm an entrepreneur that's motivational. And of course, as you can imagine, hearing things like that's the best. But the medium of Instagram, three years ago, I'm like, oh, fuck, motivational quote thing's gonna really work here. You know, that pushed me so much further, but I don't sit and think of motivational quotes. I just fucking live, say motivational shit, and then the team's like, oh, that's a good one. You know, like, I mean it. I mean, it's a very, you know, so to me, authentic truth is what matters. Sitting and figuring out a course or content to teach versus doing a meetup for 30 people, having them ask questions, filming it, and then making the course that way, you win twice. Do you see what I mean? I live to create the content, not I have a process to make the content. So, but you can, like, I, I you know, think about, think about how great this is. This before was just like you do something for somebody, but they're just doing something for me, like maybe I said something smart, or maybe we use our clip and they're like, oh, that's exactly me, and it helps somebody out. It's so fucking meta, it's crazy, you know? Um, so it's, I, I couldn't recommend enough people vlogging. I don't, one of the things, maybe you, if you're really watching me carefully, my vlog's not growing. My YouTube is not growing, you know? But I'm not stressed, like my team's stressed. D-Rock wants to like fucking kill somebody, you know? But I'm pumped. Because it's so much more valuable than how many views the vlog itself is getting. My podcast has exploded 
when I rebranded to an audio experience instead of a show, so I can put keynotes or some of this on it. That's just, I, I haven't sat down and recorded a podcast really ever outside of the pod sessions, you know, like, and I have a top 100 podcast. So it's being thoughtful of how to live and let the content come from that versus how do I make the content, which is what everybody's struggling with. Documenting, not creating. The creation comes from the documentation. And then when you realize that, you'll start putting yourself in a position for things that create content. The reason I speak more than any other reason is it's such a content creator, which then becomes a brand awareness thing for Vayner. Do, 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 do. But then what are you doing? Sorry to no, just no continue. Worries. What is it that you're doing different on Facebook long form versus YouTube? Neither. Or, or are you just Neither, repurposing nothing, the same thing? Nothing on that. That I repurpose, rarely do I repurpose. But okay. The copy will be different because we think about like the shareability nature of Facebook versus, right? But, um, and, then, and then, so those two I use more like television because I think they don't have enough differences or any reason to do that. Um, obviously, I'm putting out a lot more content on Facebook than on YouTube. There's some differences, but like a vlog will go equally there other than the copy supported. Let's get that woman in the back as well because we'll miss her if we don't. Hey, bro. Joey Roberts, Alliance American Football, Elite 11. Uh, quick question. You want to be the Jets owner. Panthers just sold for $2.2 billion. When the CBA comes around, how much is the next franchise going to be sold for? Uh, I'm not sure. I think they're going to go. I think people think they're going to go up. I think uh, down. I think they're going up. I think that the next uh, TV rights, when this goes to Amazon, when the NFL goes to Amazon or Apple or Facebook, and they pay four times more than Fox and CBS, the value of the organizations are gonna go up, right? Um, gambling is gonna have an impact on the value of organizations. If the organizations are gonna be able to tax the gambling in states, that's gonna go up. So, I don't know. You know, as somebody who truly thinks and wants to buy the New York Jets, I don't care. That is like, I can't worry about that. You know, it's back to like defense. I can't worry about that. I need to amass wealth and influence and put myself in a position to succeed. I can sell a piece of my company to Steve Ross, who owns the Dolphins, to get into the football family, right? We can start Vayner Sports to become the most player-centric. Like, Vayner Sports for me, which is different than for AJ, is no joke about the 2050 free agency class. When I own the Jets and I'm disproportionately the most player-friendly owner in sports, I think, some kid's gonna sign with the Jets instead of another team because they just wanna play for me and that's gonna be the trigger point for me to finally win a fucking Super Bowl. So when I tell people like I think long term, I think they think it's fodder or, but, but I always tell them, look at my actions. I sold a piece of VaynerMedia to get into that world. You know, like I was, when I tell kids to be patient, when I was 28 years old or 27 years old, I, I was making $47,000 building a liquor store business for my dad that I had no equity in. So when kids are like 26 and they're like, oh, if I, I'm like, patience, motherfucker, you know? <laughs> so I don't know. I, th I think they're going to go up. I think everybody's overreacting to concussions. Uh, I really do. I think this is one of those things that like ultimately, like, I just think people, you know, I think, I think the NBA is going to grow. I think esports is going to grow. I do think that the NFL maybe isn't in, like, it feels like two or three years ago was the pinnacle of its force in the world. That's fine. But I think the, but I promise you this, the next TV contract, which is gonna come from an internet company, not from a network company, is gonna make the values go way up because they're gonna pay a lot more money than people think. Uh, hi, Gary, Shaleen Johnson, how are you? Great to see you. Um, Snapchat and podcasting. So Snapchat, first of all, I freaking love Snapchat. And I love it even though I have a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the following that I do on Facebook. Much bigger return on investment there. It crushes for us. And I think that's because people are self-selecting. It's like a speakeasy. They can't find you. It's so hard to be found that once someone finds you, like they really are engaged. So Depth that's huge. Depth versus width. What's that? Depth versus width. Yeah. I'm this, I totally I, agree. I, I wonder what you think about, it doesn't Snapchat, isn't that like the big thing they're missing is like let people be discovered. How do you, you know, like it, it's impossible to find somebody there. Yeah, I think, but I think, look, I think where Snap lost its way, in my opinion, is that they were too ideological about being cool. Mm, yeah, they you still know? are. They, they, I think there was audacity. They were so on fire. It was so on, the, I mean, if Instagram doesn't create stories for another two years, Snap would have been 
a monster. It clearly had penetrated the 30 and 40 year old set. It was well on its way, um, but Facebook did. I love how everyone's like, Facebook copied and like tried to make it like bad. I'm like, that's called business. The fuck are you gonna let someone? It was like, like I was in fun, like everyone's like, they copied. I'm like, have you looked at every business in the world? Like, that's just so funny. Anyway, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think that they have a very unique point of view on their product. Uh, I'm not sure what they're gonna do. I'm watching very carefully. I've not left them for dead the way most people. If you're willing to engage one-on-one -on, -one on your snaps from your fans, it's probably one of the most powerful platforms. Huge, huge. And also to speak to customer journey. They will tell you what they want, what it should be priced at, what they didn't like about your last product. You don't have to create it in a test tube. Yeah, they but will that, tell you. That, I would tell you that's dangerous. You need to find the right balance between those two things. The companies that go in too deep in that direction tend to lose as well. You know, it's kind of like that cliche thing. That I don't know if it was the Porsche guy. I remember somebody said it. Like, if I listened to my customers, I would have made like a faster horse or whatever. You know, like, you, you've got to be careful True. a little bit with that as well. You and know? then as for podcasting, um, which I also love, I am really curious what's going to happen with a paid model. Because um, I, I happen to listen to a lot of podcasters who I'm, I have bought into that Patreon type model. Well, it's coming. And, and so do you think that there's going to end up kind of like in cable or in radio yes. where there are networks and that's what yes. we're paying for? Or individual, like there'll be networks, you know, and then there'll be individuals. Like I'm never going to join a network and share economics. And I've been offered, I mean, there's some, there's multiple, the Netflix of podcasts being built now that are going to be subscription. I've, I've been offered seven figures already to be one of the faces of it and only be behind a paywall. I just value the attention more than the banking of the money up front. But it's coming and everybody in here will pay for a podcast, you know, in the scheme of things, if they enjoy it. Like, plenty of people here would be thrilled to pay $9.99 for a season of cereal. They just would. You do it all the time. So I think that it'll be a la carte, or it'll be in things, and I, I think a lot. I think some people are gonna make some real money on podcasting over the next decade. Thank you. You're welcome. Real, three more. Quickly to your depth versus width uh, comment just a second ago. I was just thinking if you can run uh, two different ads, one of them gets you um, deeper with less people, the other one gets you shallower with more people, and initially they both create the same return on investment. Which do you take? Um, if any, I, if either, I yeah, mean, maybe I don't think, an I, you know, to me, to me, I, I don't even think of it that way because I'm just trying to get deeper with more people, you know, like, like, I think the answer is, it depends on what I'm in the mood for that moment, right? Like, you know, when I sell sneakers or, or a book or something, uh, I'm thrilled to get the short term ROI right then. But to me, I don't think about, to me, it's a forever in perpetuity game to get deeper with more. Right, and so you also don't, you know, now we're getting into some complicated things, which is like, you, you know, cool, shallow now, but maybe that's also the first point of touch that lets you get to a different place, right? So the ultimate goal is as deep as possible with as many as possible. I don't overjudge the day in and day out. I don't even judge the year in and year out. That's the macro plan when you're building a brand. Super important to me for Gary V. The reason, look, the reason I decided to do something very similar to what you guys are doing here, but different is that when I buy Pop-Tarts or Puma or whatever, because that's my plan, right? I'm not looking to start, I mean, I'll do some starting and some incubating and flirting, but not to the scalar level that I think is gonna be built here. I'm looking to buy nostalgic brands. It's because brand is already established. I think it's easier. I, I think there's a lot of money to be made when you understand why Marvel was a bankrupt comic book company but a trillion dollar movie business. I don't think we understand how humans think. I don't think you understand how valuable the fact that most people in here know what Ragu is. It's Ragu's job to now become contemporary. Right? Like, I think I can buy the He Man Masters of the Universe IP for 400 million and sell for 7 trillion. I need to make Skeletor hoodies. I need to get The Rock to be He Man in the motion picture. I need to make the best AR game. There's a lot to do. But if you can take something that's known at scale and make it contemporary, you got a real shot. So that's how I kind of think about where you're going, which is I think the better game is to never put yourself in a position to think about anything other than deeper with more. And if you do that, you're always gonna take, in the scheme of things, when Ty goes to the runner, you're gonna take deeper with less. To your point, like I talked myself through it, deeper with less. 
Yeah. Hey, Gary. My name's Brad, and uh, I work for a nostalgic brand called Igloo Coolers, and just want to know if you want to buy it. Sure. Yeah. And, uh, sure do. And when, when you buy it, could I still work for you? And uh, what would you do with a company like that where the employees average about as old as the company in 72, and um, they operate completely in pre-internet, and my buddy Jason and I are the entire marketing company department for a five hundred million dollar company. Yeah. So I'm, how do you move the needle? This is quick? why I'm so excited about my life, right? Like to me, everything I just heard. Now all I need is the world to collapse, right? Like everything I'm doing for the last eight years has been about the economy collapsing the next time. A company like that doing five hundred million with that kind of brand that like a lot of people here know, including myself, right? with doing all the wrong marketing behavior is in deep shit when the world collapses. And you, you start buying that kind of, kind of company for one times you know, EBITDA versus seven. <laughs> so, you know, I, look, I think you know what it is, right? Like either a company is, you know, a company's DNA is super fascinating. You know, it, it, took, me, it took me being this deep into my business career to understand why certain sports organizations do actually win over time, right? It just stems from the top. Like the Knicks aren't gonna win shit until Dolan's the fuck out of there. That's facts. That's just 100% facts. It just stems from top. So, you know, to me, I'm so pumped about everything I just heard because I know there's about 40,000 businesses in America that have similar things to what you're up to. Plus, I'm building an agency that when shit hits the fan, and Coca-Cola went from having a billion to spend to 400 million because the world just collapsed and they need to readjust, they're gonna do it with me, not with who they're doing it. So when the world melts, Vayner's gonna go through the roof and I'm gonna make a lot more cash and I'm gonna be able to buy brands for a lot less because they're gonna be selling off assets. So I'm just, you know, it's really funny. Everybody thinks I made it or I'm out there right now. I feel like I'm in my most patient zone ever. I'm just, I feel like I'm a fucking cobra in the grass right now. Like, I don't think anybody really realizes what I'm actually up to. I might buy the Knicks, too. Hi, Gary. Uh, Hi. I'm Lise. I'm a content creator. And my question is kind of non-conventional, but I just wanted to know, um, how do you find balance? You know, how, uh, between all this work, I'm sure all of us have all these questions. Like, sure. we can't sleep at night, right? We're thinking about work. Uh, we're thinking about all these things that we can, may or may not accomplish. And some of us may even have... Uh, some kind of imposter syndrome per se and throughout your journey there's a lot of things that you may want to accomplish that you don't know if you even have the ability to do that yeah so what kind of advice would you, would you give everyone here it's a great question for me it's it comes back down to honesty right a couple things that I do number one the, the reason I stay balanced is I just made a ridiculous statement I also equally know that I don't mean shit I mean it even when you're impacting people. Like, it was really interesting. This is gonna be a weird answer. That week or two weeks where David Bowie and Prince died and both of them had about a 24-hour news cycle, I was like, oof, you have to really make an impact in today's world. <laughs> you know, because I'm playing for legacy, to be frank, and so like, that kind of fucked with me, to be honest. I was like, maybe I should go for the money because if Prince is getting like 18 hours of love and then we're on to the next shit, like you gotta really accomplish a fuckload to get your week. You know, I've been looking for a week this whole time. Um, I'm being serious where, uh, where I think it's really great when you think you're up to something but you also know it doesn't matter. It's crazy to me how much like I go, to me I find balance in extremism on both sides. That's how I find balance. I also don't judge myself. Like, my L is my L. I really think it goes back to worrying about what other people think. I'm able to sleep super well at night and find super balance because I'm just not judging myself. Let me tell you where I start. I don't judge myself as a husband and a father. I try to keep myself accountable, but I'm not gonna fucking like, you know, beat myself up all year or two for in life, for life. I watch people because I missed a recital. You know, like, do I want to miss the recital? No. Do, but do I have to check the box of the current state of what's politically correct as a parent? Definitely not when I know this is the worst era of parenting ever. Right? 
You know, because we're, you know, like when everybody wakes up and realizes us, the fact that we've been over coddling our kids, everybody wants to blame bullying and Instagram for suicide without realizing the reason it's happening is when you don't let your kids lose in the first eight years of their life, they're fucked. And because you don't want to feel the pain because you love your kids so much and you're so micromanaging their shit because we have so much prosperity that we can worry about dumb shit like kids picking on each other in first grade, not like putting food on the table. So like, you know, like I just don't judge, my, like I find balance in fucking the fact that we're all just doing the best we can. <laughs> like what? If I don't buy the Jets, great. Like if I don't like like if I don't make more money, if I lose a count, like what? To me, it's just fucking look ahead. Like too much entitlement, too much judgment, too much insecurity. Like I'm just in my own head. Like I just don't give a fuck about what anybody thinks because you all suck at shit too, right? So like I find balance and like I'm trying. And if I'm tired, then I'll fucking sleep. And if I want a vacation, I'll go on one. If I don't, cool. And if I go nine years in a row trying to kill people for 18 hours a day, that's what I'm gonna do. And that's me. And that's me in my own head. And that's that. I love my kids. I love my wife. If now, if they want something, I'm gonna deliver to the best of my ability, right? But we're all just judging ourselves. Like back to imposter syndrome. It's because everybody's fucking flexing and fronting and bullshitting because they care about what other people. You don't post a photo of fucking cash to your ear for yourself. You do it to make other people think things. You don't take a picture of you with like you know attractive people in fucking swimsuits and a fucking 800 pound fucking floaty swan and you know. <laughs> For yourself, you do it because you want other people to think something. When you can start getting into a place where you don't care about what other people think, you get real happy real fast. Um, I've always seen a correlation between entrepreneurs and quarterbacks. I spent a lot of time with quarterbacks. We got to work on one this year together with Kyle Allen. Um, and I always tell guys, when you play quarterback, you sign up. We sign up for quarterback, you sign up for all of it. The highs, the lows, all of the success and adversity. I believe the same thing about entrepreneurs. Um, and so I just appreciate your perspective on it because I think all the stuff, the, these last two years especially, watching like the patience, the self-awareness, that, that, that is that. It's, you sign up for entrepreneurship, we're all in different phases of it here, uh, but you do sign up for all of it. Um, not just the photo on Instagram, I'll never forget, Taylor had a great post. Uh, it was him, he's got three cute kids. It was him and his wife and there's three kids and they're smiling, it was perfect, it was like Disneyland or something, and then the comment was a paragraph about what happened five minutes after. One of them threw up on the other one. The other kid's screaming, crying, who threw his spaghetti on the girl, and then the, the wife's upset. And it was like that microcosm so of, of what that is. And, and uh, I just think that honesty and that truth is why um, folks like him are, are, are uh, changed and why we're so appreciative you spent time to it. So I appreciate it. Thank you guys so much.